week three of our Jonah series called Indictments. And um, this, I'll be honest, I, I, could, um, I could spend a year in this book. This is just a phenomenal book of the Bible. And um, it's one of those things that um, we often take for granted when we're um, in the middle of of life's kind of storms and different things. We forget that the, the scriptures and the Bible, it teaches and, and lives in such a way that um, if we get into it, we find that it speaks to our lives. But if we hold it at a distance and it's just Jonah and a whale, we, we kind of hold it off and we don't get into the story. It reminds me of the two interactions that I've had in my life with orcas. You know, it's a good time for a story with an orca. Um, so a killer whale, Shamu. Anybody ever seen Shamu? Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's a wonderful fish. I worked at SeaWorld, and I remember in San Diego, I remember seeing Shamu fairly up close, and it's this very contained environment, and Shamu does these cool tricks and uh, is pampered like a rich Saudi prince, and... Um, treated incredibly well, and it's this kind of sanitized version of what an orca can do, right? It's pretty cool for us, and uh, I think it's pretty cool for Shamu. She gets a good life, or um, it, I don't know if it's all male and female. I never checked into that, but um, these whales have this kind of great life in this, in this show, but we get to watch in kind of a sanitized version. I remember when I was, uh, I was 23, or I just turned 24, we were in Victoria, Canada with the Caribbean Mercy, and a friend of mine who sounded exactly like Speedy Gonzalez. Remember Speedy Gonzalez, Little Mouse on the cartoons? God, I love Speedy Gonzalez. If you've never seen him, YouTube it today. You'll spend a whole afternoon enjoying yourself. So Speedy Gonzalez is who Jarrett Colon sounded like. And he and I took two jet skis out, and we went out of Victorious Harbor, and we started chasing the big boats in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. And then we started chasing whale-watching boats. And we noticed they all stopped at some point. So we come up on our jet skis and just cut the throttle, and we're like, what's going on? And all of a sudden, a fin goes by me, and it's like much bigger than me. I'm like, this was a mistake. I do not want to be here. And all I could hear out of the corner of my ear was Jarrett Cologne on a jet ski going, because he killed the engine. And I using, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And I'm like, you're a dead man, you little empanada. Whoosh, you know, and I took up, I left him. I was like, I, I have no loyalty to you at this point. He survived, and apparently he's doing well, and we're not friends for obvious reasons. But there's a difference between a raw encounter with something and a sanitized, staged encounter with something. Today is supposed to be a raw encounter with God, with the scriptures, and with the book of Jonah. We are actually staying right in the same text we were in two weeks ago before Dan Seaborn came and called me Donald Duck. If I call somebody Matthew McConaughey, that's a compliment. He called me a bird that doesn't wear pants. <laughs> Not appreciated, Dan, but I still love him and his awesome voice. But anyways, all right. And one weird thing about Donald Duck, have you ever noticed like when he wears no pants, he wears a shirt, but when he gets out of the shower, what does he do? Puts a towel around him, you're like, but you, yeah, I, it's just weird to me. And I got called that name in church, and you guys didn't defend me. All right, so we're going to talk about Jonah, and we're going to get a more raw, uneasy, up-close, natural version of it. And we're going to wrestle with it a little bit. And I think we're going to enjoy ourselves but also be challenged because Jonah is a book of indictment. Jonah indicting God about his character and God stepping up to the plate, taking his kind of audacious indictment in the chest and then answering with his character. He answers out of his character. We'll get to that next week. This week, we deal with um, a kind of a theology, kind of a concept of what it looks like when we face those who sink in the storms of life. And we're going we're gonna to kind of juxtapose this in some weird ways today. I'm going to, um, we're, we're doing a schoolyard pick on some people. We're going to include Jesus in this teaching today, though Jesus, um, the Son of God, had not been born into the world yet when Jonah was in the, in the picture. But Jesus is very much a part of what's going on. And then we see the life of Peter has a unique intersection with this. And then we know Jonah. 
and we're going to talk about Jonah. Before we get going a little uh, any further, I just want to quickly tell, remind you, last week we, or two weeks ago, we talked about the Easter eggs that take place, the things that God hid within the book of Jonah that would come to life in the life of Christ. There was the issue of sleeping in the boat. Jonah was asleep in the boat, and Jesus slept in the boat. We remember that, right? Jesus sleeps in the boat because he's Lord of the storms. He's Lord of the wind and the waves. Jonah is asleep in the boat because he's either in denial that the storm is his fault, or he's just purely exhausted from running from God. Because you and I both know, when you have a heavy conscience, when you've sinned against God, you kind of lose your step in life. You kind of get a little groggy, and Jonah probably was just physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted, and he cashed out in the bottom of that boat. So there's this asleep in the boat thing going on. And there's a few other Easter eggs that take place within this where um, Jonah is eaten by the whale and he's in the belly of the whale for three days. Everyone assumed dead at this point. But what happens is Jonah gets burped up onto the beach and, um, and Jesus gives a sign of Jonah and he says, look, I'm going into the belly of the earth for three days. But when I come out, my life is going to speak a transformational gospel. So there's this, this kind of reality of the Easter eggs in Jonah kind of revealing we see Jesus differently. And so we need to understand that those who sink is a critical reality because we're in danger of sinking. We're in danger of sinking the way Jonah did. So what I want to do is I'm going to reread the text we did last time. We're going to jump back into it because it's a great springboard for this. So um, why don't we uh, take a minute? Oh, sorry. I sped ahead of you. All right, chapter one, verse four. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid. Each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below deck where he had fallen into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up, call on your God, maybe... He will take notice of us so that we don't perish. And then the sailors came, and they said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. In the ancient world, the casting of lots was a bit like throwing dice, and it was a way to kind of, hopefully the spirits would work in such a way that the lot fell to the responsible person. So um, they, they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. So they ask him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? From where do you come? What is your country? What people are you? And he answered that beautiful Hebrew phrase um, that says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And in in the Hebrew text, it just says, Ivri Anohi. And it's this basic statement that says, look, I'm running from the God who made it all. And that's very bad news. And this terrified them. And they ask, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had told them about it earlier. But the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they ask him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. Remember that. Remember that. That's an important fact of this. The men did their best. Instead of doing what would please God, they did their best to roll back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Has anybody here ever gone on a cruise? Anybody? Anybody here ever got caught in a storm on a cruise? Oh, no, there's none of us. Too bad. It's awesome when it happens, right? Because everything that's nice, and you think Captain Steubing's going to come out with his, you know, his, that's 80s people laughing, by the way. It's a love boat reference. Um, But come out with the trays, and it's all nice. But it's very different when you're in 20-foot seas, 30-foot seas, and the the ship is heaving and dropping, and people are like, oh, man, this is the worst. That's why I don't go on cruises. My my vacations didn't sink. So, um, so, you know, you go on this, and you get nervous because you see the sea getting wilder and wilder when you're on a cruise ship, a big cruise ship. These boats were under the power of wind and oars. It would have been a crazy ride. 
It would have been like, you know, think of wearing a parachute in a tornado. It would not have been fun. It would have been pushing them in every direction because they had no propulsion into the storm. So the seas grow even wilder, and and the men are trying to row back. Then they cried out to the Lord, please don't let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, which he wasn't. For you, Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Again, I love this. Just remember with me, if you weren't here a couple weeks ago, they throw him overboard, and the seas become calm. Remember, where's Jonah? Hey, man, turns out you are the issue. You floating there, and it's like, should we pick him up? No. Look what he did to us before, and he's like, it's fine. I can still hear you. He's right there. So it's, I mean, let's not sanitize this. This is awkward because now they have to willingly leave him. They have to willingly leave him. But they offer sacrifices, make vows to the Lord, and take off. Then the Lord provides a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Again, picture it with me. Poor guy out in the middle of the ocean. I feel really something just ate him. Like, think of it with me. I want you to keep picturing this. You wouldn't be like, no way, that seemed weird. You'd be like, no way. He just got jawsed. Something ate him and took him away. You would be kind of blown away. You're like, God is mad at this guy. You would have all kinds of theories. But what we do know is that God wasn't so much mad at Jonah as he was seeking him. He was seeking Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, and he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, to the very heart of the seas. The currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight yet I will look again towards your holy temple. That's a brave statement from inside a fish. The engulfing waters threatened me and the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountain I sank down, to the the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I I still just got to paint the picture. What did that look like? Have you ever had the unfortunate experience of seeing someone throw up? Anybody? If you're a parent, you're like, you mean every Thursday? Like, it happens a lot. But anybody? Yeah. You've seen it? Have you ever seen a whale throw up? Or a large fish, just I shouldn't have gone to the taco truck. I feel so bad in here. And it just, and he's like, oh, you know, you had a Hebrew. Like, okay, Hebrew National. It's, it's not a good hot dog, so go have it. And you pull him up, he's all bleached and white, and he's like, I got to tell Nineveh God loves him. And he takes off. Imagine this. Imagine the reality of Jonah's story and what God's intending to do with it. But we have to wrestle with the fact and the truth that maybe, just maybe, storms are not all they're cracked up to be. What if the storms of this life are actually God's way of seeking you? What if you and I, during the storms of life created by our own sinful choices and selfish desires, are God's, are the storms are God's way of of seeking us, of not letting us run away unchecked and unfound. What if the heartaches of this life are not just the results of our sin, which to a degree they are, but the storms of this life, the things that tear us apart and are dearly costly, what if those are God's way of seeking us? We've said it before, nobody generally comes to Jesus on their best day, right? Nobody's at Disney World and like, oh, Finally, after meeting Mickey, hugging Goofy, and having a funnel cake, I need Jesus. That's not the way it works. Generally, it's very Psalm 40-esque. 
<clears throat> you lifted me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, the, the gloopy, gloppy, horrible, clinging nature of sin, and God lifts us up out of it. On our worst day, God finds us. So what if God loves the storm as a means of seeking us? It means this, that if you're here and your life is a raging kind of tempest around you, congratulations, you're being sought by Almighty God. You're no different than one of the ancient prophets whom he says, I will go to every length to find you and to get you back to myself. And we have to recognize that there is a power and a reality in God seeking, and he uses the world around us. So let's talk for a minute, walking versus sinking. Let's just talk. I think it's Matthew 16 where Jesus um, walks on the water. I think it is, or is it Matthew 14? Either way, don't quote me. Um, But in in the Gospel of Matthew, I believe it's 14, you see Jesus walking on the water. He's out walking on the water. That's kind of crazy, right? You ever do that as a little kid? You get about 20 feet from the pool, you're like, I'm gonna walk on water. And you run as fast as you can, and the first thing that happens when you hit the water at full speed, you go bloop, and you sink. And you just kind of wipe out, and you're like, it didn't work. It's still not Jesus. And you go try it again because you're a little kid. And you just keep trying. You can't walk on water. But Jesus walks on the water in the middle of a storm. He's walking on the water. Why is he able in the same kind of storm that buckled sailors and made Jonah afraid, in the same kind of, you know, tropical tempest, Jesus is walking on the water. And I, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is not subservient to the winds and the waves. He's the one who rebukes them and they calm down. Jesus is Lord of the storms, which tells us again, what if storms are God's way of seeking us? What if storms are a way that God's going to reveal himself to us? Jesus Christ walks on the stormy waters. But what do we see next? We see like a Peter figure who sees Jesus and his first words are, oh my gosh, it's a ghost. The straight up Hebrew or Greek translation is phantasma, which we get phantom from. That's what they scream, ghost. <laughs> it had to be, I don't know. I just think it's funny when grown men see ghosts. But um, they scream ghost, Jesus is like, no, no, no. I am he, that I am language from the Old Testament. He's like, no, 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 I am Jesus, I am here. And Peter says, if it's really you, call me out of the safe confines of the boat. Call me to you. And Jesus goes, well, come on, Peter. Come on. And he's like, here I go. It's so scary. It works, John. He who he loves is in the boat. And he starts walking, right? You know Peter's like, it works. I'm on the water. This is great. And then what does the scripture say? He began to notice the wind and the waves. And immediately he began to sink. And he cried out to the Lord. There's a third sinker in the group. Or a second sinker. Jesus doesn't sink. There's a second sinker. His name is Jonah. He doesn't even walk. He's just like, look, the storm's my fault. Throw me over. I'll face my consequences. Death becomes me. That's his thing. They throw Jonah over, and he never got his eyes off what? Himself. Jonah never got his eyes off himself. He never got his eyes off who he hated. He never got his eyes off whom, what wrong he had done. He looked inward constantly. How much does our society reflect Jonah? And if you don't believe it does, I'll say selfie stick and we can all just look down and be like, I know I have one. It was a gift. It was a gift exchange, but I use it. And you know, right? Anybody here ever take a selfie? Who here just lied in church? <laughs> Not the accidental selfie where you have wicked double chin. You're like, no, oh, gosh, what is that? But like the one where you're like, you know, anybody? Come on. Yeah, we've all taken a selfie because it was a good hair day, right? You're like, I look good today. And you get your picture, right? We are like Jonah. We keep our eyes right here, right here, the middle of the universe. Everything, we are the sun and the universe rotates around us. Jonah never got his eyes off himself. 
So here's what I have to do. I have to tell you what I've had to tell myself, and these have been miserable sermons to write, because I am so akin to a Jonah, not a Peter who gets, I'll take a risk, but then I get swallowed by the storms too. I'm definitely not as much like Jesus as I'd hoped to be at my ripe old age. I feel more like someone who is sinking. So we see this reality of Peter, Jesus, and Jonah going on, and you go, okay, whoa, Whoa, in Jonah, we see comparisons to Peter who sinks, but also Peter had this moment walking on the water. What's different? It was that he had his eyes on who? On Jesus. Peter was looking at Jesus when he was above it all. And people say, don't give me a simple Christianity that's oversimplified and easy. But what else can I give you? That when the storms of life rage, the only peace in them is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only peace we'll ever find is the Lord Jesus Christ. So my call to you is not to ignore the storm. We can't ignore the storm. We have to recognize that storms give us unique opportunities, right? Unique opportunities to live into a moment that changes everything. There's a couple of moments that I remember hearing about. One of them was Joe Montana when he was playing the Bengals in the Super Bowl. And he walked into the huddle. They were down. It was late in the fourth. And he cracked a joke. He, like, told an organized joke, like, knock, knock, who's there? The Bengals. You know, like, he told a joke. Everybody just went, do you tell jokes in this setting? I don't know. He does. He seems confident. I'll follow him. When John Elway was the quarterback for the Broncos, the greatest years of my life. Um, when John Elway was quarterback for the Broncos, they were on the two-yard line in the, I mean, the horrible pit of Cleveland Stadium with the Browns, like their defense had been shutting them down, 98 yards to go to even tie the game up. And John Elway walks into the huddle and he goes, all right, boys, we got them right where we want them. <laughs> Is John not smart? Well, he went to Stanford. He just seems really stupid now because we're on the two, man. And it's now known as the drive, right? If you haven't seen it, Google it. You can join me in Bronco Fandemonium. It's great. It's amazing. You see this thing where someone captures a moment and the moments are never easy. So let's look for a minute about moments in life through scripture that help us understand why we shouldn't ignore the storm. First of all, there's tough choices. What do we see in this text that is a tough choice? What is a tough choice? You've got this Hebrew guy who's confessed his wrong, and he's like, look, you guys got to throw me over. And they're like, no, 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 we're not throwing you over. That's not cool. I mean, you're confessing. We'll take you back. And God's like, no, no, we're doing restoration on my terms. Throw him over. And they're like, nope, we're going to row. Well, row on, little fella, and the seas grow wilder than before. And eventually they're like, look, I'm really sorry about this, Jonah, but there's going to be a a departure early. You're going to be leaving the boat because we can't face this. Tough choices. Are there things in your life you need to make tough choices on? Where you're like, you know what? No more of the excuses. I need to make some tough choices and get rid of things that are opposed to what God's trying to do. There are tough choices. There's also really hard roads. In Matthew chapter 16, I know I have this chapter right, Jesus asks a question. Peter gives a confession, you are the son of God, son of the living God, the Christ. And Jesus is like, whew, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter, but my father who's in heaven, your name shall no longer be Simon. It'll be Peter, Petros, rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Peter's like, what now? How great is that title? Like, how good would you feel? And then Jesus in Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23, there's this short dialogue where Jesus sees that God is revealing to his disciples who he truly is. So he says, look, I have to go to Jerusalem. I will be handed over to wicked men and I will suffer much. Peter, freshly full of himself and awesome with a new title of The Rock, and he comes up and he's like, well, no, not you, Lord, not you. That should never happen to you. Peter didn't want his Lord and master to go down a hard road. 
But Jesus knew the road he must go down was redemptive for all humanity and mandatory. And what does he say to Peter? After saying, this is the rock on whom I will build my church, he says, get behind me, Satan. Okay. How do you respond to that when Jesus tells you that? That's got to sting a little, doesn't it? But that's what he says. Get behind me. Because sometimes redemption takes hard roads. Christ called us to take up a cross and follow him. When did we ever mistake the taking up of a cross for a golden cross on a necklace and that would be enough? It was an invitation to die ourselves for the sake of his glory. There's tough choices There's hard roads, and then there's these really difficult dark nights where even Jesus, who had said, look, I'm going to have a hard time, we find Jesus late in the Gospel of Matthew in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he says to his disciples, will you just stay awake with me? The 12 disciples come with him, then he takes three with him, three disciples from the group, and he says, stay here and pray with me. My heart is overwhelmed to the point of death. And they're obviously rattled. They don't know what's going on. They've just eaten a big meal. They're kind of nervous what Jesus is saying. Jesus goes and begins to pray to the, till he sweats blood. And the disciples do what? They pull a Jonah. They fall asleep. And Jesus comes back and says, wake up. Wake up. Don't you see like I'm dying here? Can't you just pray with me for a minute? Can't you be my friends? I don't want this cup. I'm asking my heavenly father to do what you, Peter, said. No, not me. God, take this cup from me, but if you won't, not my will, but yours be done. And he was deeply troubled, and he was really distressed, which means there was probably tears and snot and agonizing groans. And the disciples went back to sleep. There will be hard nights Difficult nights if redemption's gonna walk your way. Things in you must die. You must decrease that he will increase. And the fact is, since Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, then we have to understand as his disciples, we will walk the way he walked. Something has to die. Choices must be made, and roads we don't want must be walked down in order that the life of Jesus Christ is fully exhibited in us. That is really bad news. <laughs> that is really bad news for you and I. I remember in the movie Liar, Liar, when he say, he goes to tell, he says, I can't answer you. I said, why? He said, because it's devastating to my case. I can't lie, and I can't tell you the truth. The fact is, I can't lie. But the devastating reality reality is our comfortable American Christianity must die in order that the church of Jesus Christ come roaring into visible, manifest life in front of them. Comfortable Christianity gets us nowhere. Faithful obedience to tough choices, hard roads, and difficult nights gets us down the road that leads to eternal life, not just for us, but the world around us. And it excites me to think that we get to walk those tough roads, because I'll tell you this, I know many people who don't know Jesus who face tough choices, hard roads, and difficult nights, and they did it without the peace and hope of the cross before them. We don't have to face it alone, because the storms we face are God's. And he's calling us back to himself. Let's apply this in two, in two quick ways. First of all, this may seem like a strange application, but I want you to think with me of what's going on in Jonah's life. You gotta build real muscle spiritually. You've gotta build real muscle. If you take steroids in this life, you will have a massive transformation of your being. But in a little while afterward, the after effects of false or cheap, easy growth come true. Your heart suffers. Ask Barry Bonds. Your head gets bigger. You know, like this HGH. You may hit a bunch of home runs, but in the end, there's an asterisk next to your name. Why? Because you didn't build real muscle. One of the realities is these hard roads that we go down, these difficult nights, these tough choices build spiritual muscle. 
in us to live faithfully for him. We break down, something of us must break down. If you lift weights in here, which I'm not a huge fan of, as my physique would tell you, but I will tell you this, you look at somebody in the gym and they're not just standing there at the juice bar and if they are, they're not the one who's all jacked up. Why? Because the jacked up crazy guy is the one standing there making grunting, squeaking sounds. Like, why are you doing that? Because he's breaking down the muscle to rebuild it. What if Jesus Christ is breaking down our life to rebuild it in his image? Let's build some real muscle as a church so that when God calls us to do something out of the ordinary, we're like, bring it on. This is why I've been doing all that suffering. I want to do something for the kingdom of God. I want to build real muscle to play the real Christian life. That sounds exciting to me, but it's a lot of work. There's no quick fixes. And when it's tough, we lean into the Lord and trust that he is the one who we're being rebuilt into. His image is the one we're being transformed into. Second thing is this, suffering and storms happen. Storms will come, but since life is full of heartache, I wanna invite you, don't waste your storms. Here's the thing. We will either be people who walk in a strange way, just at peace above the chaos of this world, or we will be the people desperately floundering, sinking in the waters of chaos. Storms will come, but the one hope we have is that Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, even to the end of the age, which means when we're in storms, we know where to look to stay above it all. It doesn't mean we're not in the storm anymore. It means through the storm, we see the one who is Lord over it. And if God's true goal in the storms of life is to reconnect with us, then we're accomplishing his purposes by fixing our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith during the storms and walking towards the one who did not consider his life something worth grasping, but stretched out on the cross and died that you and I may have a new life So since there are hard roads, since there are tough nights, since there are these difficult choices, what if we, the church, started making decisions that build muscle and allow the storms to come and don't change who we are? This world doesn't own the narrative on you. Jesus Christ does. Pray with me. Come, Lord Jesus. Speak and move in us. Give us a sense of uh, holy discomfort and the ease that we live in So that, Lord, when the storms do come, we have built muscle that resists the temptation to find the easy way out. God, thank you for the story of Jonah. Thank you that in sinking, you didn't let him sink beyond redemption. So, Lord, give us the courage, like Peter, to step out of the comfort, religious shell we've built and face the storms on your terms, not ours. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So, if you're in denial of the storms you're facing, he is your truth. If you are exhausted from fighting the fight and you're just ready to lay down and just give up, he is your life. But if you are willing and you are ready to walk through this storm, he is your way. These storms of life don't own you. He does. And if you are in Christ Jesus, it is his storm calling you back to himself. My friends, go the way your master calls you and live faithfully in his power, his truth, and his strength to the glory of his gospel and the redemption of lives everywhere. Your life is not dictated to you by the storms. It is given to you by the keeper of them. As you go from this place, in the storms of this life, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious unto you. My friends, as you leave this place, may you experience the hope that is. Your storms diminish as he increases. The church must leave the building. You're dismissed.